Hello and welcome to summer class week three of developing, organizing, and managing school counseling services and programs. I am going to go through a lot of information on this PowerPoint presentation, and I will also have links in the PowerPoint so that you can go to some of those links and find out more information. But it is a lot of information, and a lot of it is going to be going through the chapters one and two of Hatch and Heartline, and also an uh, overview of chapters three and six that we'll talk more about next week. But I also want to let you know that your leadership papers will be graded soon, hopefully by the middle of the week. Um, and also your needs assessment assignment will be due on Wednesday. So you want to make sure if you have any questions to let me know um, ahead of time, but we will kind of go through that a lot um, today. Your discussion question for week three is talking a lot about what you want to do to start off this fall with your school counseling program. And it talks about how you, know, you want a comprehensive developmental school counseling program that you need to have be data driven and you need to have research to support your curriculum and small group topics. Um, obviously, as a first year counselor, it's really difficult to have everything set up, but the discussion question is going to start having you think about what kinds of uh, what kinds of curriculum, what kinds of ways are you going to have uh, your staff know what your goals are for the year, what your job is, you know, what your role is as a school counselor. So you, um, the questions are just what are your goals, you know, how are you going to share your information to your staff, you know, what are, if you are joining a program that's already in place, that's awesome, but how are you going to contribute? And also, if you're starting a program all on your own, what are going to be your first steps? And how do you get visible and have the students get to know you? How do you share what your role is with everybody in your school? And so how in the last two couple are how to you how do you show accountability and um, making sure that you want to uh, show that it, you what you do makes a difference with the students in your school. And then lastly, if you had one wish for your school counseling program this fall, what would it be and why? And that's going to be a really important one. This is kind of a fun question. I think students kind of um, appreciate, think, start the process of thinking about this because it is something that they will have to do in a few weeks. And again, I want to make this class very practical for you so that you have some things ready to use. So, just to review the needs assessment assignment is you are going to give a needs assessment to either students, staff, or parents. You might do it to administrators, um, but you want to, it, the needs assessment is going to ask specific questions that are going to help you to develop your program goals. It's also going to show if you give the needs assessment to the different groups, what are some discrepancies between those groups. You need to be very intentional and ask questions of, in a way that you're going to get the answers that you want. And this might take a little bit of trial and error, but it's going to be really important for you to ask specific questions that have a lot to do with what your program, what you want your program to be. And then always use technology, use Google Forms. There's other options out there that you can also use to look at the data and figure out, you know, um, instead of going through one by one, uh, there's going to be, uh, there's other programs out there as well. And so after you get your needs assessment done, this will help you to develop your school counselor core curriculum, your individual planning, your response services, and your small groups. And we're going to talk about all of these things tonight. The needs assessment protocol, the, pay, the assignment will be worth 60 points. You'll get five points each for APA style, English language, and organization. The uh, content of your assignment is, you know, the summary, the write-up of your summary is who did you choose to implement this needs assessment to, why did you choose this group, how do you plan to implement the needs assessment, and then any resources that you use. So really be specific and share a lot of information on why did you choose this, you know, how do you plan to implement it, what are you going to do with the results, and then also you'll get 15 points for the needs assessment questions. So make sure that you include those, and you can either include the 
a screenshot of the Google Doc if you or Google Form if you use a Google Form, um, or you can use a screenshot of whatever else that you decide to use. Again, depending on what level you're going to give the needs assessment. <clears throat> And like I said, if you have questions before this week, just let me know and I can do a quick Zoom with you or a phone call or something to clarify. So we're not going to talk a lot about needs assessment development results, um, but if you were to use your needs assessment, what would your next steps be and what would you do with those results? So if the results that you think, oh yeah, this is exactly what direction I thought it would, uh, the, the answers would go, then you can go on and continue planning your curriculum, planning you know, your small groups. But if, it's, if you don't quite get the results that you think, uh, that's okay. And, and you're going to have that. You might just need to ask some more questions or you might need to go back and, and ask different questions that maybe will give you better information, or you might need to go back and look at some of your other data. So make sure that you are looking at your results and sharing those results because you wanna make sure that you have um, information and you, you let people know that they didn't just take a needs assessment to take a needs assessment, but you are going to do something, some action with that. And this is an example of an action plan for a school counselor that you can use your tier one. We're gonna talk a lot about the tiers tonight. Uh, tier one core curriculum is going to be for all students in your school, whatever grade level, they are going to uh, be there. It's going to be uh, information that all students get. And so you're gonna use that. And you, this is just an action plan template that you can use. It's actually in with the, um, the links that I shared last week that um, that Hatch and Heartline have in the back of their book. And it's just a really good way to separate out again, what grade level are you going to use the results with, your lesson title, what curriculum content materials. We're gonna talk more about curriculum content and why you need to use things that are evidence-based and use things that are gonna be helpful to students that are hopefully going to work. You need to talk about when you're going to do it. That's going to be also in your calendar. Uh, presented in which subject, depending on you know what grade level in the elementary, you might have specific times where you go into the classroom and do classroom school counseling lessons. In, uh, in the high school and the second, in the middle school level, you might work with different um, core curriculum teachers and take time out of their day, but it's really important that you make sure all students get different things in the tier one. And so what, how many students, what ask a mindsets and behavior, we, we touched on that a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, that there's, you know, certain mindsets and behaviors that you need to cover in your program, you don't just pick things out of the air that you think they want, that you, they students should uh, need to know. You need to make sure that they fit in with some of the mindsets and behaviors. There's also other uh, pro, uh, guidelines that you can use. The CASEL, we're going to talk a little bit about that. That gives a lot of information for uh, social emotional learning and lots of um, standards that you want to be using. Again, you need to make sure and follow standards. And then your attitudes, knowledge, and skills to be measured. Um, we're not going to go through a lot of this, but the pre-post test assessment that in, in the Hatch and Heartline book, there's a lot of examples of pre-tests and post-tests, and they always cover attitudes, knowledge, and skills. So your attitudes are what people, what ideas they have about certain things, it's their attitudes about it. You wanna make sure you might try to change some of their attitudes about, uh, you know, do they think school is important? Do they think attending school is important? Your knowledge, you wanna make sure they understand specific things like how many how many requirements are required to graduate from uh, so you know whatever school and then your skills you want them to, you want them to actually demonstrate something like getting into your school uh, your uh, student management system and figuring out how many uh, credits they still have to get and things like that so all skills Knowledge and attitudes are the three areas that you're going to assess. And then you're going to also use outcome data, your um, either achievement-related data or achievement-related 
Dan, and we talked a little bit about this last time, but hopefully your attendance rates will improve. You know, you might have student involvement in activities, ninth grade uh, credit deficiency rate, and percentage of ninth graders with a two point or high, higher GPA. These can all be different things that you look at with that outcome data that hopefully things will improve once you've given your core curriculum lesson to everyone in that grade level. Just to go back and talk a little bit more about how school counseling programs have changed so much in the last 50 years. And with the changes to school counseling programs, there also is a lot of responsibility. So that means that school counseling programs can't, again, just be very responsive and uh, school counselors sitting in their office waiting for students to come to them. You need to be very intentional. You need to be very proactive. You need to align your programs with the goals from your schools and your districts. You need to use the mindsets and behaviors or other standards like CASEL. Um, you need to make sure that you are valued and for what you can do to make a difference with students that your, that your stakeholders, especially your administrators, can see that the um, interventions that you do make a difference and improvement in student achievement um, or you know student behavior. And so in 2014, school counseling didn't always uh, get the respect before that we were never asked to the table of really important uh, groups that were meeting on you know improving education. School counselors were just never invited. And so Trish Hatch has been an integral part of making sure school counselors are at the table. And in 2014, Michelle Obama was actually invited to our ASCA conference in the summer. And I was actually at that conference and it was pretty exciting to see her um, legitimatize school counseling. And I shared at, with our staff at the beginning of the year that it didn't matter if you were, you know, what political uh, stance you went with, but it was pretty exciting to have the, uh, the president's wife come to your, your conference, your professional conference, and, and really, you know, talk school counseling up and, and make it valuable and, and, you know, understand that she understood how important we were. So again, it's not school counseling. You have to follow different. Um, you have to follow the ASCA national model to make sure that you're doing the things that school counselors need to do, and you don't just, like I said, sit back in your office and wait for students to come to you. That is the guidance counselor where students, uh, school counselors, wait for the students to come to them, um, and then tell them what they need to do. I shared this link with you last time, but we didn't talk about it. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about it because I think it's really important for you to understand what are some appropriate activities for school counselors and what are some inappropriate activities for school counselors. A lot of times school counselors are in charge of the master schedule in their secondary school and maybe even in their elementary if you have certain um, classes that need to be scheduled and moved around. And so that should never be your main responsibility, especially doing all of the input to your man, you know, student management system and things like that. But it would be your job to advise the administrator, advise whoever is doing the scheduling on, you know, what are some good times to have certain classes and what are some good groups to have um, you know, together? And what are some good classes at Cedar Falls High School? You know, we had a lot of um, concurrent classes from Hawkeye where students could get college credit and high school credit, but it seemed like we kept um, increasing that and, you know, the uh, then we would talk to the college admissions counselors and they would tell us, you know, these ones are good ones to do, these ones maybe not as helpful to students. And so that's our job is to advise and make sure that students are getting good class options and that your schedule is going to be helpful to you know the majority of students, but it's not to build that master schedule. School counselors have a big role when you're working with new students in your schools. Um, we should always be in charge of orientation, coordination, you know, maybe doing a schedule for a student, 
advising new students, setting them up with a, you know, with a buddy or, you know, making sure that they can get through the day with some support and checking in on them. We used to do new student groups once a quarter um, at Cedar Falls High School, but it should not, our job for new students should not be just doing the paperwork and data entry or checking on addresses and things like that. You should have a secretary that is uh, able to make sure that they enter the data for the students and, and check you know, the addresses and things like that. Testing, that's another one that in the past, school counselors have always been in charge of coordinating um, and achievement testing like you know, ISAS and, and things like that. Uh, that really shouldn't be your job setting that up and coordinating it. It is your job to look at the results and make sure you're looking for patterns, you're looking for desegregation of the uh, results and figuring out what are some things that students need you know, a little bit more help on. Is there certain groups of students that need more help on? But it's not just setting that up. I know at Cedar Falls High School, we always, we didn't have to do ISAPs. We used to do the ITEDs and we had to, count out booklets and all that kind of stuff, which was just such a waste of time. Um, and not a waste of time, but it was something that somebody could have done that um, we could have used our time a little bit better for preparing you know, students for the testing instead of having to count out all the test booklets. We also give the um, um, PSAT, which is something that you wanna, you, know, you're, you give to your sophomores and your juniors to prepare to be a National Merit Scholar. And that's a big deal. And a lot of schools have a lot of National Merit Scholars, but you know, again, your job is to coordinate it, but hopefully you have somebody that's not taking as much time, or even AP tests it. Um, my long-term sub, I had to do two AP tests, which took a lot of my time coordinating that. You know, and again, there could be parts of it that you do, but sometimes you have to get creative and have people, other people um, do the proctoring so that you're not sitting for half a day and proctoring a test when you could be meeting with students and doing things that um, more planning and, and, you know, things that are going to make more of a difference to your students. Providing counseling to students who are tardy or absent. You definitely need to be, need to know who are your students who are absent. Uh, all the time. Who are your high flyers? Who are your students who are tardy? Bring those students in. Talk to them. Make sure you're finding out why. Sometimes there's a very simple reason why a student might be tardy all the time and you can maybe do some uh, problem solving to help that situation out. You shouldn't be the person who has to sign excuses, you know, for tardy or absent. You know, you shouldn't be um, the person, you know, in putting all that data into the student management system, but you do need to be aware of that. Disciplinary uh, problems. You always want to know who the students are who are having disciplinary problems. And there are different times when I really want to sit in on a meeting with the administrator and the parents and the student if they have had a problem because I want to make sure that I can support them when they come back and, and I need to know what all the things that were talked about. But it's never it should be your responsibility to you know assign the discipline consequences or be that disciplinarian because if you do that students aren't going to probably want to come to you and share um, their concerns or you know, ask you for a lot of help if you're the one that's doling out the discipline. And I know a lot of schools, depending on if you have supervision or not, a lot of people, a lot of school counselors might have morning supervision or, or lunch supervision, which at certain times that can get a little bit iffy because you might have to, um, you know, be a disciplinarian at times, but it's also really positive for you to be out there and visible and, you know, showing, talking to kids in those, those areas. So ideally, if you don't have to be a supervisor, that would be great, but you should also uh, really try to make sure that you're visible and, and showing students that you know you you care about them and asking them um, you know during those times you know going around and talking to students providing short-term individual and small group group counseling services to students that is your appropriate activity your school counselor is not pr to provide long-term counseling in schools to address psychological disorders this is a really controversial thing because there's a lot of school counselors in like areas, very rural areas that feel like they don't have any other option. But I think if you're really doing your job and making sure you're meeting all of the needs, not just your social emotional needs, but your academic needs, you know, and your career 
um, college career exploration needs of the students that you really don't have time to do long-term counseling. And I know that a lot of school counselors are getting their mental health, um, their mental health counseling degrees so that they are more apt to do, uh, to be able to identify students with problems. And that can be a very helpful thing, but you also, if you, you need to make sure that how much time you're spending with students isn't um, taking away from other things that you can also be doing. You do need to consult with teachers for scheduling. You need to consult with them on, you know, your school counseling curriculum lessons uh, based on the developmental needs and needs identified through data. You should never be a replacement for a teacher if they uh, are a substitute uh, or, you know, sub for teachers if they're gone. You know, you might do that in a crunch, you know, if it's, it's a very important thing once in a great while, but it should not be something that secretaries think they can just call the school counselor to have that have you sub because that's going to just show that attitude well i'm really not doing anything anyway and you really need to be doing something with your time um, that you're not available all the time to be subbing and right now it's really hard because there's a lot of subs um, in every school every day and the subs there's a sub shortage shortage so make sure again that you're not be, being a sub when uh, it's it, you know when it's needed because that's going to take away time of you doing things that are more important and then student records again you shouldn't maintain student records but you need to know how to interpret them how to do test scores how to make sure that you are you know getting the questions uh, the information from your registration and things like that that are necessary. You need to interpret it, but not be the person in charge of maintaining it. And then also the grade point averages. Um, make sure again you know how to do that. You might have to figure out, you know, again, certain groups in certain grade point averages. Are there are there patterns? Are there certain groups that are left out at higher GPAs? What are some things that you can do to help even out the playing field for that? Um, you shouldn't have to compute grade point averages. When I first started as a department chair, we had to always figure out how many students were in the top 25 percent, 50 percent, and top 10 percent. And I always went right to the math teacher because I am not a math person, and he helped me figure that out. So those are some really good appropriate activities and inappropriate activities. And you want to be careful because sometimes you will be asked to do those inappropriate activities, but that's where you need to show data that you can be doing more um, beneficial things to help students with your time instead of doing some of the things that are just times, um, you know, taking up your time. So when you're implementing your school counseling program for all students, you need to make sure that you're advocating for all students, making sure that you're looking at systems and uh, identifying systems that might um, really harm students who are marginalized or maybe disadvantaged. I know we talked a lot about, at, yeah, we, I've on, I was on the equity committee for our school district and we talked a lot about you know, how many kids are in certain extracurricular activities depending on you know, um, gender, depending on um, uh, ethnicity and on, SC, on uh, socio, social uh, socioeconomic status. And we wanted to make sure that we're trying to make sure and have uh, all students get the same opportunities. And sometimes this is really hard, but you need to make sure you're advocating for all the students, especially ones that might be disadvantaged or marginalized. You need to make sure that you have standards-based curriculum that challenges all students and prepares them for college and career readiness. Just like in a math class, you have a, a, a curriculum that you know you're, some students are going to be way ahead, some students are going to need a little extra. You need to have plans to address all the students. You need to make sure and use assessment tools to measure, monitor, and report students' needs and progress. This is, you know, again, using technology. It's going to be a really uh, powerful thing for you. And if you are not as techy as you want to be, find somebody in your school who can help you with that and can share um, tips and techniques and maybe develop different um, uh, assessment tools for you. And then make sure you hold yourself accountable. Share the results of your student outcomes. Sometimes they might not be the best outcomes and they might uh, need to be a little bit better, but you still need to share that. That's going to make you more accountable. And then you need to also make sure that you design intervention systems of support for students who have identified needs because that tier one level is going to 
address every student. Tier two level is going to address students who need a little bit more. And how you use those, um, you know, the standards are the ask a student mindsets, my, uh, ask a student standards and mindsets and behaviors for student success. And you should be very, very familiar with these. If you haven't, they're uh, in the link I shared, but you know, there's, um, sorry, that's really, really small, but the mindset standards, there's six of those. And those are a little bit general. Those are, um, you know, that all, you want all students to have those mindsets though, that, you know, that self-esteem, they, you know, they, they want to be able to have a positive attitude towards work and learning. They want to have self-confidence. You want to have some really, um, you want to have lessons that will address those mindset standards. And then you also want to have lessons that address the behavior standards. These are going to be more, um, you know, the different learning strategies, self-management strategies, and social skills. These are going to be a lot more specific, and you want to have your lessons for your large group and your small groups addressing some of the behavior standards. Again, you're not just picking things out of the air. You want to make sure that they're specific in addressing some of those um, standards. And they also, they can each be applied to academic, career and social, uh, career and social emotional domains, all three domains um, that the school counselors work with. And you also need to know that the reason those guidelines were developed and, and that the um, standards were developed so that school counselors could practice with more intention and increase, increase clarity. So, you know, again, you're not just sitting there thinking, oh, I think I'm going to teach about this certain thing today because I like that topic and I want students to know about it. No, it needs to be something that goes under the mindset standards and the behavior standards. And then one thing we didn't talk about last week uh, or the week before that was the ask a school counselor professional standards and competencies. So we talked about ethics and how important school counselor ethics are, but we also have school counselor professional standards and competencies that you all need to follow. And this follows along with the same pattern as mindsets and behaviors, but there's seven mindset that's, mindsets that school counselors need to believe. And these all, if you read these and you really feel um, Strongly, these need to be what guides you in your developing your program. Um, school counselors need to be leaders. They need to promote and enhance school student academic, career, and social emotional outcomes. They need to work with, you know, again, your school counseling program is not just you. It's involved in your students, your families, your teachers, your administrators, other school staff, and community members, other education stakeholders. You need to make sure that you believe every student should graduate from high school prepared for a post-secondary opportunity. It doesn't always have to be college, but it needs to be something that meets their level and that, you know, they know they have done some of the um, assessments and things to figure out what it is that they can, um, you know, that they like and that they want to do to satisfy their lifestyle. And then they just, all students ha uh, should have access and opportunity for high quality education and that all students can succeed. And this is one that you, you really need to follow. And sometimes that's hard because you're going to have students who come with a lot of barriers, but you need to find a way to have every student learn and every student be successful. And then the behaviors, again, these are a little bit more specific under professional foundation, direct and indirect student services, and planning and assessment. And they kind of go into the four different categories that we're going to talk about about the national, uh, ask a national model. But you need to make sure and demonstrate following standards in the design, implementation, and assessment of a school counseling program. So make sure, again, that you are very um, well skilled in all of these different things. And we'll talk more about these as we go on. So if you haven't seen this photograph, it is the four areas that the national, ASCA national model works under. Assess, deliver, define, and manage. And as you can see, the arrows kind of go back and forth. The assess goes down, and then the deliver and the manage go up to the assessment. The um, define goes up. I mean, it's, it all starts pretty much with the define. You need to make sure you have student standards. You need to have a vision, a mission of your school counseling program. You need to um, 